Guys, welcome to another segment of the 101. Today we are going to be discussing the basics where everything started with toy collecting, movies, and that would be comic books. This is how I got hooked. This is how most people that start along the path start with comic books. So, to begin with, if you've never picked up a comic book before, where to start? One of the places you could find them, the best places, would just be local bookstores, comic book stores, and now with social media, online. Some of the main things for comic books you have to remember is there are hundreds of them out. So there are main companies, so if you were to go to a Barnes & Noble and check the magazine racks, some of the two main companies, and also that you've probably heard of through the movies, would be Marvel and DC. These are simply brand names and each one has their main characters. DC would have Superman, Batman, uh, Marvel is, you've seen the Marvel movies hopefully, The Avengers, Iron Man, Captain America. So that kind of gives you a, a real basic branch. Those are the two main. There are also other books called Independence, which are once again just another brand, you know like Ford, Chevy, it's just another brand of books and sometimes they specialize in different types of books. So for example, uh, one might be a horror book company, one might just have uh, their brand of superheroes, another one might do comedy books for example. So that's primarily what the genres, well not genres, but what the, the, the companies are. They're just simply different brands with different types of books so there's something out there for everybody. Once again, best places to find this stuff, if you just wander in a Barnes & Noble or a local bookstore, magazine racks, they'll be up there. Uh, local comic book store, if you wander in, racks are filled with just hundreds and hundreds of books and anyone working at a comic book store will be able to point you in a direction of something. It's it's all personal taste just like a movie or anything else. Now, people have asked me, well, you know, I've never read a comic book before or, or uh, where do I start? There's so many titles, where do I get started? What What's cool? Really what's cool is what you like. If you're into comedy, I'm sure there's a book out there that someone can point to you and say, here's a comedy book. Or if you want to jump on the superhero bandwagon plenty of superheroes. Basically, page through them. Look through, uh, when I started, I would pick up a book and I would like the artwork. I would look through it and then I'd pick it up, read it, and if it was a good story and I liked a particular writer, I may follow that writer. And once you get hooked that way, you learn to branch off into other books. So, for example, if I like a particular artist and he switches books, I may follow that book because I like his style of artwork. Or if you like a particular story, uh, Frank Miller, for example, is a, is, a, is a writer. If you like his particular brand of story writing, these guys usually don't stay on books for indefinite amounts of times. So they jump off to other books. Follow that if you like that type of style. And once again, there is something out there for everybody. So in terms of how to get started, it's potluck. Just browse the racks, find something, pull something you find interesting. There's no right or wrong answer to this. So just jump in. It's the best way to get started. Now, I'm going to talk about the different ways to actually collect comic books or where to get started. Um, for example, if you want to read the actual comic books, comic books are like a television show. They're like a soap opera. You buy one and then you buy the next issue to find out what happens next. That's really how you get hooked. It's like a TV serial. You read one issue and you want to go out and buy the next one to find out what happens next. Or there'll be one issue that maybe refers to another issue, a storyline or so-called a story arc that will branch into a, another book which you may or may not want to pick up to follow that particular story. So that's, a, that's kind of the appeal of a comic book, at least in my mind, you know, the, the cool artwork, the story, and you want to know what happens next. Now. If, it's, if you don't really want to follow, for example, a story because the comic books don't end and you just want a one shot, you know, I want a beginning, a middle, and end, like a movie, well, they have something for that. That would be a graphic novel. So here's an example of a graphic novel. Now what this is, is it's a collection of a group of comic books that cover a story arc. 
So rather than if you don't want to collect the comic books uh, for whatever reason, you don't want to wait till the next issue, these usually come out a year later than a particular storyline, and you pick them up and you can read them in one night. Sometimes there are multiple of these if there's a huge story arc that will carry over, so it may be several graphic novels. So the way that this works is it's the main book with, all, with hopefully just one story, sometimes more. So this is what a, these generally look like. And then you can see it's all the pages and everything from a regular comic book on the inside. So these would be the actual issues. And then the synapses on the back, so you could actually you know, pull them off the rack and see if it's something that interests you. And then on the spine, it tells the, the title. And sometimes there's numbers. So if there's a whole series, sometimes there's a whole series of these for the Avengers, for example. Or there's multiple story arcs within. Um, you know, you could go one, two, three, and that would be listed on the spine. So that's another way to collect comic books that if you don't actually want to continuously collect the books. So that's a real good option. Now, the other option that you can do, which is now with digital media, is once again, so you don't even have to leave the house. You have them now that you can download on your computer. So you could download a digital comic to either your computer or whatever reader you happen to have. And it's the same thing as the actual book, only in a digital form, obviously. Unfortunately, they cost the same price, so you're not saving any money on them, but you don't have to store them or anything else with them, so they don't take up much space. And once again, it's the same thing as actually picking up the comic book. So you can just kind of cruise through the pages just like so. Double tap on them to, for zooming in, zooming out. Same thing as collecting a comic book as the difference being, once again, it's on a digital format. So it's easier to store and sometimes read and more convenient just to download it. So there's that. Now, when you're considering all of this, what you're thinking is, well, why would I get a digital media? Why would I want the uh, graphic novel? as opposed to a regular comic book. This is where things get a little tricky and depending on what if you want to how you want to collect. That's really what it comes down to. If you just want to read, pick them up, follow the issues, uh, not use a lot of space, digital media is great. It, you could just sit down, read them one night, easy to get to, no problem. If you don't mind waiting or you just want to test the waters with a whole storyline and see what you like, graphic novels are perfect. Now, what a lot of collectors do, uh, and the term collecting, is you buy the actual hard copy. Now, you may ask yourself, well, why would you do something like that? Because sometimes, as the issues, depending on the popularity of the issue, and we'll, this is a whole other section, but depending on the issue, when you have the physical issue, if you want to trade it, if you want to sell it, you have the physical issue. And if for some reason a movie comes out that becomes a huge blockbuster uh, or a character is introduced that everybody wants to fall on the bandwagon and it, spar it makes a movie and launches a bunch of other books, that's where the, the collecting the actual issue comes up because then a value is attached to that because everyone wants to, as a collector, people want that. Comic book collectors want the original issue. They want the hard copy. That's where that falls in. So when you pick up a book, having a physical issue, having the physical issue, that's the, the trade-off for that, is you have to find somewhere to take care of them and somewhere to store them. Um, and, and depending what, why you're collecting it, obviously, if, if I'll say I'll say this now, and I'm going to state it later. But whatever book that you buy, collect because you enjoy it. If you are collecting for value, it, for a comic book, it's 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 a crapshoot. Do not go into this thinking I'm going to buy every issue on the shelf and make money on this. There are so many factors that determine an actual physical wealth of a book. Buy something you like. And if something happens to be movie made, or happens to spawn, 
or happens to shoot up in value for whatever reasons and you decide to sell that issue, that's great. That's a bonus for you. But overall, buy something you like. That, that's, I can't stress that enough. If you're going to start, don't go in and go, what's going to be worth something? Start because, you know what, I like this story. I like this artist. This appeals to me. Because otherwise, you're, you're just throwing money away. Buy for you. And once again, when you have that physical copy, if it happens to increase in value for whatever reason, or, hey, your buddy wants to spend $10 on it because he's missing it or something, and you want to get rid of it, you've made a profit, but don't think like that. Buy it for entertainment purposes only. Anything else after that is a bonus. So, going back to value now. There is a guide that, like a card guy, a blue book value, that tells what the value, quote unquote, value of a book is and what gives a book value. Once again, very tricky. Something is only worth what somebody is willing to pay. So what affects a value of a book are the conditions of the book, the popularity of the book, and the rarity of the book. Those are the main factors. So when you hear about a Superman number one being worth millions of dollars, the reason of it was because at the time nobody saved those books. There were only X amount made and people would just toss them out. The age of that book, they were, they were 19 in the 1930s, nobody saved this stuff. And to keep it in a good condition, a readable condition, to current times, that's why those, and, and then for example a Superman, which spawned just everything. It's a key book in the sense that it, it, it spawned all these other books. When that happens, that's what gives that book value. They're so hard to find. There were so little of them saved. There were so little of them put in big it kept in good condition. And it spawned the whole, or for the most part, the superhero genre, where everyone jumped on that bandwagon. So that is an example of, of why that book would have value, per se. Uh, once again, like an old car. You know, if there were only X amount made, or the, the shape they're in, the maintenance, same type of idea. Um, some of the newer books, for example, may take off because of a movie being made. Uh, and that affects the market. I have a book here that I will use as an example. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit the ratings and stuff. Now, this is the comic book Overstreet Guide. This is the guide, like a blue book for a car, that basically kind of prices out some of the books and their value and based on the condition they're in. So if you open this up, it's all alphabetical. These come out once a year and the, the pricing changes um, every year based on popularity, based on rarity, a uh, lot of factors. But if you look across here, up the top, you can see there's different gradings. Um, they go from something called good, very good, fine, very fine, um, mint, near mint, and they don't have the, uh, the lower grade ratings, but we will discuss them. And it goes by alphabetical title, and then if you, if you can look across, you can see the values, or the suggested price of the book, if street, street, the street guide. So this is what people use, and you know, once again, it's a negotiating tool. This is what people think this book should be quote unquote worth, give or take. Um, once again, that changes across the board and I will explain it to you in something I brought. So once again, this is just a, a reference, a guideline, and this is what a lot of the comic book stores use, uh, collectors use when they're trying to set a value to their book to either trade them in, sell them, sell to other collectors. So, once again, that's the Overstreet Price Guide. So that was the Overstreet Price Guide. Now, I will kind of give an example of exactly what value, speculation, that kind of thing of a book. This book here is the Guardians of the Galaxy. So this is an example of, once again, 
uh, describing how value kind of works in the condition of a book. This is Guardians of the Galaxy, and there's a movie coming out. This is the first appearance of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, as you can see from this particular book, it's not in great shape. Um, and talking about, once again, the value of a book. This book up to, this book up to probably a, a couple years ago was, quote unquote, had very little value. First appearance of the Guardians of the Galaxy, you could get these as a garage sale. It was a $10 book in very good shape, tops. Now, with the movie coming out, all the collectors went out and started buying these all up because they think the movie's going to be a hit and is going to spawn other books um, and increase the popularity. So everyone wants this book. So a year ago, this was a $10 book that you could get pretty much anywhere. This is a bad copy, or a, a, an average copy book currently, that I paid uh, about $60, $65 for. Okay? That, once again, a year ago would have been no problem. So that is an example of value and speculation on how these books uh, gain or don't gain value. Uh, it is not a rare book, so you don't have that going for it. It's simply the speculation of the movie becoming successful and this book becoming harder to find because all the collectors have picked it up. So, and as you can see, it's not in great shape. Uh, so I will talk about the shape and that also affects the value. I paid $60 for this book. There are some of these going for whatever reason, uh, a $300 book because of the condition of the book. So I'll have Junior step around and he can explain kind of the, how the grading system works and uh, how the value of a how the condition of a book will affect the value. So come on over, Junior. Come on over to the dark come side. Come on over to the dark side. So would you like to explain uh, how the grading system works and how that would work in the condition of a book? No. Please do. No. Please do it. <coughs> there you go, sir. My show now. Go to town. Here you go, sir. Thank you, sir. Don't touch me again. So as Kerry mentioned, he's got a copy of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy here. Actually, it's I had to correct you. It's Marvel Superheroes presents first appearance of Guardians. Yeah, my, first my, appearance. I stand of the Guardians. corrected. Yes. So I mean, like he said, he pretty much nailed it when he said the condition is everything, and it really does determine the price of the book. Uh, it also depends on the dealer, because there are some people out there who just they'll because of the name and like you said, what you mentioned with the uh, the movie coming out, they'll just jack the price up. If so, it's it goes back to that whole saying: if somebody wants it bad yeah. enough, they'll pay. Exactly. But from what I see, I mean, I'm not a professional grader myself, but you got a great copy here. Um, you've got some. You mind if I take it out? No, absolutely. Now here, this I want to point this out before I take it out. Some people tape the bags. I personally do. I love it. Keeps I, them in stock. I keep, I, keep I, I do not. I usually tuck the bag underneath, but I didn't do that for that one yet. So some people, there's two ways to go about this. Uh, even the greatest make mistakes. I've done it before, but since this is not my <laughs> book, I will not. Uh, I'll do it the other way. Uh, I can sometimes keep the tape on the bag and slide the book out, but you always risk the fact that you might get, get hooked. hooked. Yeah. So there, what some people do here, and you've got the right tape for it. You've got to use scotch tape. You don't want the clear tape or yeah, like what is the regular tape? Scotch. Scotch, right? What? Not this one. This is the white masking tape. Isn't tape. It? No. This is masking tape. Yeah, what you want is mask. I don't know my tape. I just know what it looks like. Uh, you want something like this, obviously without the fingerprints. Um, it really comes off the bag very easily, but it also seals the bag pretty good as well. Uh, most people, you would want to take the tape off before you take the bag out, just to, or the book out, excuse me, just to be on the safe side. Slide it out carefully. Now, as you can see, this book on the top spine here. It's actually got some tape on it keeping it together which is not fairly uncommon in a lot of older books like like you mentioned earlier right. the Superman book a lot of books like that you would see taping heavy yes it does affect the grade and it actually does lower the grade some um, you've got a hole here you see pieces of the cover missing some slight spine ripping and more tape holding the bottom of the spine there uh, it has a slight spine roll and what a spine roll is, is when you kind of see what's supposed to be printed directly on the side, kind of rolling over to either the front or the back direction. It's got a couple creases here on the bottom. Nothing too bad, at least in my opinion. I mean, yes, of course, it does drive down value. But for a book like this, you've got one in great condition. It's even got that new comic smell. As you can see, it was still stapled in the inside as well as being bound. 
pages are off white to cream, which isn't bad. The yellower they are, the, the worse off. But it's all, like I said, it's got the tape here so you could kind of see. One thing you really want to do, it's going to be kind of hard for me to do this upside down, but you never want to open a comic book all the way, you know. Uh, the farther you open it, the more stress lines it'll give you on the spine of the book. So you, what you kind of want to do is hold your fingers in there. What I personally do when I read a book is, I'm going to have to turn this upside down so I can demonstrate to carry. Uh, I would take the bag, if it's bag and board, I take the bag and board in my hand like this, take the book and lay the front cover on the bag and board. And just, just to brace see, the spine. Yeah, and you see how it kind of have it. Also what it does is the dirt and the oil on my hands does not affect the cover now. So you don't get the smudges. It Whatever's on there stays on the bag. So it's, the cover is absolutely fine. You see that? And then I just kind of keep the book with that slight spine roll there on the back. Never enough to pierce the page, but just kind of flip through it like this. Another better way to do that, I mean, that's just me personally. I don't know how many other people do that. Another better way is to actually just lay the book flat. Because as you lay it flat, the spine, the, or excuse me, the it's cover. It's a natural cover. Exactly. And you, it's no crease to it. Some people will sit there and they flatten the book out. You don't want to do that. The more, the more times you open the cover, the more stress lines it'll create. So you never ever want to do that. Um, as Carrie mentioned, the condition does factor in. Now, Overstreet does put out a separate guide to grading comic books, and they're very strict with it. I mean, you have to be. But if you're somebody like Carrie who appreciates the book, excuse me, strictly for the story purposes. You can't go any wrong with this you know this is this is fine the covers not falling off you know pages aren't torn or missing this is almost the best you can get for a book like this you know I mean yes you can get better but then you're gonna be paying more money keep that in mind especially with the book like this that's coming out and there's a movie announced more buzz around it it's just the way it is and I'll, I'll jump in real quick the kind of stuff that I collect is something called readers copy what that means is these are books strictly for my personal collection. They're not very expensive books for the most part. There's a couple that cost me a little bit, but they're easier to find because they're not in great shape and I, I'm not buying them strictly to resell them. Readers copies are real good for stuff like that. If you're just starting out you go, you know what, I want some of the classic books. Reader copies are fine. If you just want to put them up on a wall and display them, which I have at my place and they look great, this kind of book is fine. They're relatively um, reasonably cost for once again based on whatever book it is right um but a reader's copy for for me personally is great because i'm not looking to turn around and make a profit on them that's kind of when you start getting into the the higher grade mm -hmm. books so here's an example of something i just pulled off the shelf but junior could explain the difference between that book that's a little beat up compared to something that's in better shape so there's something right there well this bag being that it's not taped is a lot easier <laughs> but you slide the book out and as you can see most books ship at least in a 9-4 condition a 9-4 is what passes for near mint nowadays uh, near mint obviously what you want is a solid 10 which is totally gem mint but those let's face it are few and far between so a 9-4 is considered pretty good uh, now, 9 6 is even better now when you nine, start saying the 9 the 9 4s and 9 6s mm -hmm. What specifically that means? The rating system, I think, goes from what zero to zero to ten, zero, zero to, to ten, and it so, goes by fives until you get to nine. So, so once you get to the nines, it goes by twos. Okay, so so once again, it's um, it's, you know, it, it's like five star, four star, three star, yeah, that kind of thing. So when you hear us talking those numbers, that's what that means. The lower the scale, the more beat up the book. Correct. And there are things listed in the Overstreet that say, hey, if it's missing the cover, it's worth this. If it's if it's you know in great shape, that would be up of the nines, eights. Readers copies are usually what around threes, twos, threes. Reader copies, uh, it all Depending, varies. Right. It all varies. See, and that's the thing. Unless you work for CGC, man, uh, with the grading, there might be something they say, hey, you know. And he's too, CGC is a company that their business is to grade comic books. Um, th what they do is they will actually have someone what they consider a professional grader uh, in the industry and they will say this book is worth X amount. They will seal that book and they will put the number on it. So this way you have, there's no dispute over the book in terms of guide. Once again, everything's being relative. But if you take that book to another collector and it's stamped with CGC and it says it's rated 2.5 based on the guide, it's that's how 
how would you describe it? That's, that's, that's solid. That, yeah, that's like the official, the last word. But I actually got to correct you on sure. something. When they do CGC, the Comics Guarantee Corporation, they have three graders okay. per book. So that way the grade is unbiased. What they'll do is pass the book off to the first guy. He looks it over. He assigns it a grade and puts it into the computer. Goes to grader number two, who does not get to see what grader number one input into the computer. So like I said, everything is unbiased. He gives it his opinion, his grade. Then finally it goes off to the last guy, who once again does not get to see the first two graders, and he comes up with his opinion. But once he does his, the It's three, an average. It's an average of that, yeah. And that's how they determine that. Then it gets put into this uh, plastic case, actually. Uh, that is they, it's not airtight. They put this carbon sheet, I believe it's a carbon sheet, between both the front and the back cover, which kind of absorbs any air that's left over when they close the case down. And in the corner is assigned the grade, the average grade. And CGC is pretty much the final word. So it's debatable. Like if I, Carrie wanted to buy this book off me, I says, Carrie, this is a 9.4. And he looks at it and he says, well, I see a Nick here on the corner. I'm going to put that at a 9.2. CGC is the guys that come in and say, you know what? No, this is what it is. So there's no debate about it. Now, the plastic cases can be cracked open. You can remove your book. But once it does that and you can reseal them, there's still a crack on the, on the spine of the case, knowing that it's been tampered with. Right. And anyone, and when you guys are watching this, just so you know, CGC is not required. That's really for the hardcore collector. That's for um, the monetary gain. If right. You're really that, in it for the money. If, you, if that is all you're buying for and you're, you're, you're like, I, you know, I'm going to buy the old books and I don't want any debate and I want X amount of dollars for it, that is what determines it. The CGC determines this book is worth X amount of dollars if you sell it to another collector or the public in general. Now, um, I have some books in my you know, collection that are CGC and I have some that I want to send away CGC. For me, it's not the financial ver reason why I do the CGC. Uh, if I could go out on a website and find a CGC case just to display right. the, the, the book and maybe have the book uh, right. Sealed in that condition. And explain like explain the, the actual what the casing is so people understand. Actually, it, I can show you what the casing is. Okay, that's even better. And magically, we now have a CGC graded comic book in front of us. Uh, this is a 9.8 graded copy of the Amazing Spider Man 700. As you can see, the grade is designed 9.8 up here in the corner. It's also got a little bit of information as to who worked on the book as far as writer, artist, cover artist, whatnot. Uh, there is a barcode on the book as well, or on the label that they put on there. What the barcode does is allow you to call CGC if you need it, if your book was lost or if you need to confirm something and they can all, it's in their database. And they can scan They it. can scan it for you. They can look up the UPC and say, no, this book is registered to so-and-so and it was graded at this grade. So it's like a security measure. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, and it kind of gives you sometimes a little uh, idea of what the book was. This big one was uh, the death, in parentheses, of Peter Parker, and it's also the last issue of the series. And up here it's across, it tells you what the name of the book is, the publishing date, and the company. CGC also puts on a little sticker here that lets you know it's officially theirs, like a lot of companies do, like the NBA, the MLB, all that stuff. It's their brand. Yeah. So this is the case. Uh, it's pretty thick. It gets a little bit thicker depending on the book itself. You can see that, and then it's clear all the way around. This specific copy has a certificate with it because of the book. This book was purchased directly from Dynamic Forces as a graded book already. So the certificate is basically just telling the buyer that, hey, this book came directly from CGC, but you're buying it through Dynamic Forces. But normally, they won't have the certificate here, so you're okay. Uh, one thing I also want to mention is the color of the label. This is a blue label. Blue labels pretty much mean it's a universal grade. You know, the book is universal, it's a regular book. Uh, there are different color labels, if I'm correct. Green is a qualified book, meaning, let's say you buy an Action Comics number one at a garage sale, you just get lucky and you decide you want a CGC grade. But beforehand, your best friend is a restorer and they can restore a book in better condition. So for basically, you. it's telling this book has been restored, it's not yeah, the it's original. Yeah, it's been tampered with in some way, shape, or form. I have a CGC qualified book that's actually. It's never been tampered with. It's a current book. It's just I bought it through Dynamic Forces, and it wasn't a graded book when I bought it. I sent it off to get graded because it was strictly limited to 99 copies, and it had a sketch on the cover. So what they did was it was qualified. They put it in the green thing and put my certificate in the back with it as well. Uh, there is a purple label, which I don't... Uh, purple label actually means restored. Excuse me. Purple label means restored. Green means qualified. And blue is universal. 
they also have another one that's yellow, yellowish gold, and that's Signature Series. The only way to get obtain a Signature Series book yourself is to have a member of the CGC group walk with you and witness the signature and then hand it right off to them. So, for example, Stan Lee yes. signing your book, which I was yelled at and I didn't know, but I have several Stan Lee books signed. Now, to me, once again, not doing it for profit. I know Stan Lee signed the book. I have pictures of it. It's a genuine signature. But to a collector or to CGC, I defaced the book because mm -hmm. no one was officially there. Once again, six and one half dozen the other. To a hardcore collector, they'll be like, hey, I don't want any part of this possibly because you either can't, mm -hmm. a picture's not good enough according to CGC. To another collector, it could be cool. You gotta, you know, the picture shows him signing it. Awesome. Right. Now, like I was saying earlier, I personally don't CGC the books in my collection for monetary gain. I mean, it's a bonus. But what I like to do is, I mean, it looks cool, you know. Uh, and once again, and it's I, cool to display. Right. It's a way to display it. And I prefer to CGC the books not not only that I think maybe may rise in value, but also the ones that mean something to me. Exactly. Like the very first comic book I ever received was Spider-Man 15 from like 1991. Uh, I want that book CGC because it was the very first book I ever got. So that's a prime example of another reason why you should do CGC. Now, doing CGC is not free, by the way. They're, they have different price tiers depending on what the book is, depending on the uh, age of the book, as far as golden age, modern age, you know, silver age, stuff like that. Uh, you can. There's two ways to go about doing it. You could either go online to their website, which is, I believe, cgccomics.com. Might be mistaken on that, but... You can Google it, and uh, you can become a member. And by becoming a member and signing up, oh, signing up for, I believe it's a year, you get X amount of books you can send in, and they'll send it back. I personally don't like doing that because you have to go through the mail. And the point is to get the best condition possible. Do you really trust sending comic books to somebody to arrive in the best condition possible? I don't think so. The other way to do it is to find the uh, CGC company at a convention. They usually do either on-site grading or you just fill out the paperwork there and they'll send you the book back in the mail already slabbed for the uh, small fee. And I will cover conventions in a whole other segment. <laughs> something else entirely. One thing I want to sh point out uh, as a collector that I know you don't do because you get for reader comics. Right. Uh, going back to the bags. Let's, yeah, look, when you start, actually, if you decide you want to collect comic books, this is a way to preserve them. As you saw the bags and the boards, these can buy, be bought at a local comic book store, and what these do is they preserve your, your books. I'll grab a, you can store them in something simple like a box. They make specific comic boxes. They come in all shapes and sizes. Well, that's a lie. They come in basically two sizes for main comics. They come in the long box that Carrie just showed you, and they come in a short box. A short box is pretty much half the size of a long box. It's yeah. about 150 books or so. Oh, I just yeah, say yep. something. <laughs> uh, the bags and boards you can pretty much get in either by singles depending on your local shop or you can get them in packs of 100. There's plenty of different companies out there that go ahead and they produce these. Uh, everybody's different. I personally go with Ultra Pro. If you look back here, the board is just slightly shorter than the bag. So when you fold it over, you kind of get a lip. You see that there? Mm -hmm. You, you kind of get a lip here. And so when you fold it over, it's kind of a pain in the ass. I like my books airtight. So I want to go ahead and show you an example of how I bag my books. Let's go ahead and slide it in there like that. Now, some people use one piece of tape. Some people use two. I do one. And there's different ways to go about it. You fold it over. And you can either go ahead and put the one. You can put it the long way. You can put it this way. Some people put one. Some people put one on each side. I personally... What I do is I take the tape, stick it right on the top there, and I put it down on a flat surface, as flat as I can get, maybe a coffee table or something. And what I like to do is start at the, hold the board down with my finger, start at the bottom, and slide up so I get all that extra air out. And once I get to here, I kind of grab the top here and slide it back as far as possible, kind of like giving it a stretch. As you see, since it had that lip here, it kind of folded over and books that are like, or excuse me, bags and boards that are like that kind of tear from the side. So you want to be careful what kind you're getting. So once it's strictly taped, I kind of use my fingers and like a Ziploc bag, just kind of do one of those. So all the air is out, it's flat as I can get it, and it slides perfectly right into my box. 
There are other ways to do it. Some people don't prefer doing it that way. Some people just fold it over, tuck I'm it one, in the back. I, and once again, I'm one of those guys, unfortunately. I don't, I just put them in, seal them up. And like I said, some of my be my nicer books I have in frames and they're up mm -hmm. on the wall, so I like to display them. Some people don't care about the crease, they just go ahead, fold it, they'll leave that small fold so there. So now like why, don't, why don't we go over real quickly how great on this book. We showed them what a, a beat oh, we up did. one. Oh, we did? Remember this was, I, I okay. say it's a 9-4 <laughs> and they ship okay. it. So yeah, pay attention, man. So that's pretty much that as far as condition goes. I'm going to go ahead and take Carrie's book back up. <laughs> um... You can find, now bags and boards are not sold at places like Barnes and Noble and places like that. They're only available either online or through your local comic book store. So that is de definitely a way to preserve your books first and foremost. But the most important way to preserve your books, climate control. You do not want them near sunlight very often because the sunlight will fade the color. And for people who, I'll jump in real quick, if you put them in your basement, no. There's leaking in your basement. Not all the There's, time. Well, my collection was stored uh, in my mother's basement for yeah. years. Okay. Well, um, it all depends on the basement. Well, you know, it right. all depends. Uh, what you want to do, cold, dark, not necessarily damp. You don't want damp. Anywhere, just kind of keep them at room temperature. If you can keep them at room temperature, you'll be fine. You know, obviously stay away from water because it's paper. You don't got to be a genius to know that. Um, that's pretty much your thing. You want them at room temperature. You don't want them too hot. You don't want them too cold. Uh, the darker, the better just because the darker it's cooler. You know, you don't have to worry about UV lights or sunlight or anything like that affecting how your uh, the condition of your books. Now, what do you, what we also need to discuss, I forgot real quick. Mm -hmm. There are different time periods for comic books. And based on the kind of the time period that the book was produced, there are different size bags and boards. Mm -hmm. So, an ex the example of the, the time periods it's would be something called uh, golden, age, golden Age, Golden Age, which are Superman books, Batman books. These are your older books from 1930s to roughly what, 1950s, 19. Uh, yeah, just about the 1962. You can get gold or both, 61. Golden Age books range from anywhere between 1937 or, or actually older than that to 1961. They're usually a little bit taller than modern books. It's just they're a little, they're a lot wider. They're almost magazine size back then, especially in the 30s. So that is, the, that is the time period for those particular books. Then there's the Silver Age books. Now you'll hear a lot of that because a lot of the Marvel books and a lot of the books that are becoming popular, where there is a um, resurgence of popularity in the comic book industry, would be something called the Silver Age. That's considered the, the actual age of comics. You right. know, that's, that's when it really took off. Because before that, you had The Flash. And then you Superman. Had Lantern, Superman. Those Batman are primarily your Golden Age books. Those were like where it began. But then once Marvel came in in 1961 and pretty much did their versions, it was competition, that's when a new age came. And it was, like we said, the Silver Age. That ran from 1961, I believe, to roughly 19... 79? Right, 78, 79, right around there. And then after the Silver Age comes the Bronze Age. Bronze Age is mostly the 70s, but, or excuse me, late 70s, early 80s to about uh, 89, I want to say. And then, and the reason why we mentioned this too is the bags are different sizes mm -hmm. and the boards are different sizes. Silver Age are different. Silver Age, they, they don't make Bronze Age bags though. They make, it's golden, silver, and then it skips to modern. And then because modern. most uh, Bronze Age is pretty much the same size, is either a silver or a modern. So it, it works either way, depending on the book. Now the Modern Age are the ones that are current up to the, the peak of the, what, the end of the Silver Age, correct? The Silver Age up to that time period, and then you said the Bronze Modern Age, age starts at 19, 1988, 89, 1990. And the Bronze Age, the Bronze fit in which ones? Uh, the early 80s, late 70s. They fit which bags? Uh, they those can fit either silver okay. or modern. It all depends on the book. So, but once you get to the modern age, you want uh, see some bags and boards don't label it modern. They either label it modern or they'll say current size. So, those are the best ones to get. Obviously, if you're collecting stuff from uh, last maybe 15, 20 years. So, that's an example on that's how to preserve your collection if once again that's the route you decide to take and you want to hold on to. Now I've talked about it but since Junior is in the shop all the time and the advice that I gave is collect for you. I mean any words, no. comments on that? I think um, I think that's really the best way to, to you go. You nailed it man. Uh, at least I get, I get two customers at least every weekend coming in new to the hobby, new to the shop. 
never touched a comic book in their life. They don't know where to begin. Um, I always tell them, I says, first and foremost, man, get what you're comfortable with, get what you know. If you know Spider-Man, you like Spider-Man, that's your place to start. You nailed it earlier, man. Uh, it, you know, you start with your favorite character. You tend to like the story. Hey, who wrote the story? Oh, I like this guy. Let me see what else this guy has done. And it just kind of takes you from there. Same thing with the artist. It might be a cover that catches your attention. You might not. You might be new. You, I heard of Spider-Man. I heard of Superman. I don't know who I like. You walk the racks. Oh, that's a nice cover. And that's the point of covers is to catch your attention, catch your eye. You know, that's, that's what sells you right away. It's like buying a car. You see a car. That car looks great. You know the car looks even better. It's like finding a mate. I, I have to take it there. You don't know that person's personality right away. You see the person, that person's cute. I want to talk to that person, and you get to know them later. Same thing with a comic book. You see the cover, I like the cover, let me get to know what's on the inside. That was a damn good analogy, Junior. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. And, and once again, I will, I will bring it up because I hear it constantly. I know I'm beating it to death. i, I got to throw this in before I forget. Go ahead. Collect what you can afford. Do not break the bank trying to get every single book. I'm trying to trying to get rich. Yeah, try especially that. I mean, I mean, like you said, if you're going to collect, there's different reasons to collect. That's your personal thing. But don't try to break your bank. Trying, oh, you're falling behind on the rent or a car payment or child support, whatever have you. You don't want to do that. The books, the way I look at it, it's hard for me. I, I look at it this way. Well, my reader copies are a perfect example. Yeah, but I, I mean, I look at it this way and it bugs me because I, I love this motto, but I can't live by it. Is you got to remember, when something is first produced, whether it be a comic book, a toy, a car, what have you, it is out there. It's been manufactured. It's been made. You can find it. You will find it one day. So, like I said, don't break the bank trying to get something all at once. Be patient. You'll find it eventually. Now, like I said, beating this to death, but once again, can't stress enough, buy for you. Mm -hmm. How many people do you have coming in the store today going, do you think this will be worth something? Because I know I used to run into it all the time when I was picking up my stuff. Going, will this be valuable? And I would look at the person. And I said, you know what? Who knows? Yeah. You know, no, that's it, exactly it, that. You, you, you're not you lying to them. You're not lying to the customer. You're not trying to be a jerk to the customer. That's the absolute truth. You don't know. It's like the stock market. Well, comic that, books are exactly. like the stock, and not just comic books, but any type of collectible, like I said, any automobile, whatever. They have their moments. The values will increase. They will decrease. It all depends on how much is pushed. How much is published? The rarity of the book, exactly. the condition of the book. Some great examples: uh, The Walking Dead, the first issue. Uh, if I'm correct, back when it debuted in 2002, 2003, they only Image only printed like 3,500 copies. Something like that. They did not do a, a huge run, exactly. and, and that book was not a popular book to begin with. No, it wasn't. And then, yeah, at that time, comics were just coming off the, the, the hurtful 90s comic boom, where Marvel and DC were both, and actually other companies as well were printing so many copies of every comic book because they thought people were coming in like the Beanie Baby Boom. People were coming in thinking if I buy 20 copies of this book it's going to put my kid through college. And it actually hurt the industry so bad that by the early 2000s people, so many people fell out of comics and that's why a book like The Walking Dead only printed about 3,500 copies. And so when people come in also if you're collecting and you try to collect anything from the 90s you're pretty much going to get it dirt cheap. 90 stuff you can find almost anywhere because it was so overly printed. If somebody, if we're, uh, 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 ugh, can't even talk. A tip for new collectors, if there's books you're trying to find and you know they were printed in the 90s, please do yourself a favor and do not overpay. Because I can guarantee you 9 Any times used 10, bookstore, yeah. anybody, you, you could use those to line bird cages. They made so many of these yeah. books in the hopes of, once again, people thought they were going to get rich quick buying all these comic books and putting their kids through college and uh, they were sadly mistaken. One other thing I, uh, I wanted to mention, you brought up the Overstreet Price Guide, which is published once a year, but a lot of people like up to the minute things. And since Wizard Magazine, which used to put out a price guide every month, is no longer around, Overstreet is the only physical guide you can use. A lot of people turn to the internet because like you said, a book is only worth what someone is willing to pay. The best way to find out your current average value, in my opinion, is you use eBay. What you want to do is search the book under completed auctions, not buy it nows. And you see what's sold and you can kind of see what it sold for and it gives you an average, okay? That's about the average price my book is selling for. That's how you determine the value. And that's if you need it right away. Personally, I like the Overstreet Guide, 
but they do omit a lot of things. Well, the perfect example, once again, is this Guardians book. Up to a year ago, that guy was saying, you know, mint condition, mm -hmm. first appearance Guardians, because nobody wanted it. 10 bucks, 15 bucks tops. Then all of a sudden, Marvel announces, we're doing a movie. So now the market changes because all the collectors think it's going to be a hit. They go out, they buy all the books, they jack the prices up. Now it's a harder to find book, and they've cornered the market because they bought a bunch of them and they control the pricing, mm -hmm. which in turn, Overstreet goes, well, now this book is worth this because of what the collectors have done. So it's a very, but the like you said, the stock market. The unfortunate thing is, like we said, Overstreet is only printed once a year. So, I mean, a lot could happen to a value of a book in that one year. You know, they could announce the movie, the Guardians move, the book shoot up a couple hundred bucks, but then what if something happens all of a sudden? They cancel production, Marvel goes bankrupt or something. All the, of a sudden, so the movie bombs? Yeah, the movie bombs, the books will go down, but you still have that one price guide from that hasn't released a new one yet, so your book is still saying that it's a couple hundred bucks. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of times eBay is your best bet for on the market thing. Personally, when I buy the, I buy the Overstreet once every five years. I can't I even tell you the last time I bought an Overstreet. I don't like to continuously buy it, but I use it as a checklist. Mainly, I mean, yeah, you can use Wiki and all this other stuff, but I'm an old-fashioned guy. I used to love having Wizard right there to reference stuff. I like having the Overstreet Guide when I need to reference stuff. Nine times out of ten, like I said, they don't print everything in there. I mean, with books coming out with so many variant covers. And not, and not only that, but also, too, as I showed you earlier in Overstreet, Overstreet is guided towards the main collector. So it cuts off at a at like at a 5 or something like that. They don't take into account a lot of the people that just buy readers copies. Correct. So that's when the market gets kind of weird and you kind of have to once again eBay it or mm -hmm. guesstimate it because a lot of people who are already using Overstreet they're looking for pristine higher grade books as opposed to someone like myself that just wants to have the book, just wants to display it, a lower grade is okay for me. And then at that point I'm thinking, how much can, like Junior said, how much is it worth to me? How much am right. I willing to pay, just like bidding on eBay, to have that particular book in my collection? Mm -hmm. um, the only thing we really didn't cover, which we can actually save for another time, is uh, the types of books out there, like variant covers and all these other items like right. that, you know. I, I, I know they exist, it's just not something that I normally purchase. Mm -hmm. um, basically... Well, if, you might as well cover it now. Yeah, <laughs> basically what a variant cover is, is what it says. Someone, they do a bunch of different covers that, and they charge sometimes more, sometimes less, to either get you to buy more of the books, or buy get you to buy a more expensive book because they've got a different type of artwork that may appeal to you more than a mm -hmm. normal book. Most variant covers are usually in a 50-50 ratio, meaning if your store orders 50 copies, 25 of them will be cover A, 25 of them will be cover B. And the only reason they do this is the companies want to spotlight their different artists and obviously make an extra buck for those people who are completionist or completists, you know, say, I have to have every copy of the book. They're going to buy both covers, so they just double their profit on that. Uh, there are also what they call retail incentives. Now, in order for to receive a retail incentive, Di that's that's you really don't know the ratio on them. It's usually between diamond and then that retailer. Sometimes previews will list the ratio depending on the sure. book. And what uh, just if you're still watching this, just you know we're going a little beyond the basics, but just so you have an understanding of why well, they're yeah, out there and what it is. Uh, basically, a good example is uh, DC puts out a lot of one in twenty five variants. Now what that means is for every twenty five copies of the book that the store orders, they're eligible to either order one of the variants or receive it for free. When, when that happens, it's all the, the price of that book uh, to be purchased is determined by the store. Some people don't care and they order 25 anyway and they get the bonus, you know, they feel that the variant is just a bonus anyhow. So they'll put it out at cover price. Some people see what people are asking for it on eBay and they decide, you know, I'm going to base it off of that. It all varies, but that's what a variant copy is. The insides are usually exactly the same, almost 99.9% .9 of the time are exactly the same inside, just a completely different cover with a lower print ratio, making it more valuable. And once again, it goes back to what people are willing to spend and the rarity. Mm -hmm. So now you've got, you know, only X amount of these books out there. So a shop might decide to make more money off of it mm -hmm. because there are only X amount. And then the collector sees it and realizes there's only X amount. They want to have that in the hopes of possibly turning a profit on it. Or they may end up sitting on it because nobody cares. The that book has no... Or, has, you know, you, right. like me, I'm a completist. I right. have to have every single cover, every printing, every variant. It's just me. Or or the cover just blows you away. You yeah. go, I, you know, I need to have that, and mm -hmm. you drop the coin on it. There you go. 
So, so I will let you have your show back. Oh, well, uh, thank you very I, much. I think you pretty much covered it. I think we're I th actually I think but, we could uh, probably uh, close I'll it out. I'll see you guys on Comics Remix. <laughs> So, that was another segment of the 101, and Junior, appreciate the help. Yep. <laughs> so, hopefully you are informed, hopefully we can get you on the bandwagon of collecting comic books. Uh, next issue, we'll see what uh, pops into mind. I'm thinking maybe either toy collecting or cosplay. So, I'm Kerry from the 101, also from Comics Remixed. So thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us, and hopefully you will jump on the bandwagon with us. You can find us at comicsremix.com, on Facebook, and on yeah, and, um, YouTube. We have our interviews and other cool stuff up on YouTube, just Comics Remix. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll be back in a, whenever we're back. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Stay geeky, my friends.